So we're just south of Barrie, and I'm sitting with brilliant artist and just amazing guy, Ted Naismith. I've been looking forward to doing this interview for quite some time. Ted, welcome to the show. Thank you for Thank taking you. the time. I know you've been all over the UK and all over the place doing other interviews and podcasts and these things. So very humble to get to talk to you. Um, my pleasure. Thank Thanks, you. Kevin. So, Ted, we're, there's a lot of things I want to unpack about how brilliant of an artist you are and your really fascinating life and the things you've accomplished. So. I want to start it off though with just a little bit about where you're from. Yeah, I was born in Godridge, Ontario, mm -hmm. and that is out on Lake Huron, a small town. It's actually really quite idyllic, and it's actually still uh, more or less the same as it was when I was a kid, which is a <laughs> long time ago now. Yeah. Um, it was struck by a tornado in 2011. Uh, there was a fair amount of damage there, but thankfully some things were spared and most of that reconstruction has been done now. Mm -hmm. um, I was down there not long ago with my sister and we were just kind of walking down memory lane. Memory yeah. lane. Yeah. Um, and it's got a wonderful beach there. There's a, actually, it's famous for its Sifto salt mine, which is quite extraordinarily yeah, large, apparently. Place, yeah. yeah. Um, and so they get lake ships in there. There's a, there's a lot that would capture a kid's imagination. We yeah, used to, sure. Yeah, we used to play in the uh, Maitland River Valley. We were near the edge of town where I lived. Yeah. You know, so uh, it's a wonderful place to go. And um, I, I have warm memories of the Bedford Hotel, especially, which yeah. is where I arrived from France with uh, uh, a brother and sister and I guess the newborn Bruce who is now grown up and a guitar player and, and a musician extraordinaire as well so cool. um, wonderful wonderful memories there um, yeah yeah Godrich is a really really neat spot it's very different than a lot of the rest of Ontario it's kind of its own little cool spot it is, yeah. it is unique you know yeah. yeah yeah so when you were there was there something about Godrich or was there something in your youth where maybe you were just suddenly had this little spark that kind of, you know, you were supposed to be doing your math, but you were actually drawing, you know, you were doing something uh, other than what you were probably supposed to? There is a bit of an anecdote there. Um, according to my mother, mm -hmm. um, in kindergarten, um, we were drawing. Um, all the kids and it turned out that I was drawing a house in perspective without you know, like the three-quarter view um, completely <laughs> just spontaneously so uh, there, was, there was a little bit of an indicator there that uh, something was going on in the art side of it uh, yeah but for the rest of the time I was in elementary school it was never particularly a special thing um, mm -hmm. and I didn't have any idea that I would actually be professionally an artist. Yeah. It's funny, you know, you just don't so it's know. It's kind of dormant until you kind of get that spark, I guess, right? That kind of knock on the head. Uh, that, yeah. Well, you know, I definitely was filling up, you know, you know, exercise books with drawings and doodles and looking yeah. out the window and being the Mr. Dreamer, the Aquarian, <laughs> that's me, you know. Oh, so, there you go. Yeah. But uh, anyway, in grade eight, um, at the time when I'd be going to high school at that point, grade mm -hmm. nine, straight to it, um, yeah. the guidance counselor took me aside and said, did you know there was a, an art program, especially commercial art program available at Northern Secondary School in Toronto? And we were living in Don Mills at that time. Mm -hmm. So um, I enrolled um, quite joyfully, uh, just thinking I was sure. just going into an academic program in high yeah. school like my sister, and uh, then I realized that, oh no, I could actually be specializing in art, and I absolutely um, blossomed at that point. Uh, cool. You know, met some great friends that I'm still uh, seeing, you know, all these years later, you know, so. Yeah. Um, it was it was a great uh, moment for me in my life as a kind of very insecure little kind of <laughs> preteen and Flemington Park, where we lived, was not a nice, uh, yeah. you know, it was, it was a little rough at times. It was, you know, sure. um, Ontario housing. And, uh, did you find that you would be a little reclusive in that way? Or do you find that you were just kind of very introverted in your own way of just, you know, you didn't really let people know you could draw because you kind of hid it in the books, right? Like you just kind of... Well, I didn't hide it or anything. And it was something of a point of pride. Yeah. Um, and, but... At the same time, I was very introspect, intro, introverted. You know, um, um, I definitely uh, stayed home drawing um, for for probably hours at times. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, it was socially awkward. You know, and my teen years and everything was was just kind of you know, fumbling along like so many guys who are kind of a little sensitive and shy or what have you. But you yeah. know, we we turn out to be the best. Um, you know, most reliable. <laughs> <laughs> material <laughs> later on anyway I think. <laughs> so but, uh, you so you you realize you're going to go to this college you're you're or the school and you're gonna to start to focus on your art right 
was there an inspiration, a particular artist who might have caught your attention back then too, or were there multiple artists who you were like, oh, this is, this is my kind of theme, this is my, my, um, my motivation? Well, I'll tell you that when I first started doing, um, you know, in grade 10, they introduced illustration classes for me, you know, there was actually a course on illustration, and the teacher who was at that time a fairly young um, teacher um, had experimented with working with Disney and things. He used to show us some of his sort of artwork that he'd done and he was definitely keen to get me in his class and so uh, um, at that point it was all about automotive art that I was inspired by and mm -hmm. also an artist named uh, Maxfield Parrish who's an American uh, illustrator, um, fine art painter, yeah, wonderfully Parrish. you mm -hmm. know kind of brilliant colors and he's famous for these sort of lovely sort of idyllic landscapes. Cool. Um, and I guess in grade 11, I was finally introduced to J.R.R. R. Tolkien, which was a kind of cataclysmic for me. Uh, of course. And, uh, now has changed the course of my life, become a vocation for me. But it was in that time of uh, the, um, you know, the, the um, laboratory, shall we say, of, of just finding my uh, way along as an artist and what I was going to emphasize and, you know, what interests were there. So there was this automotive thing that was possibly a professional direction for me. Yeah. Um, I really idolized um, the, the illustrator of Pontiac ads in the 60s and you know absolutely still love that stuff. The old GTOs. And yeah, 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 exactly. The old you know, yeah. Parisian, well they didn't do the Parisians, but the Bonnevilles, you yeah, know, the Bonneville. even US versions of mm -hmm. everything. Uh, yeah. Um, and then having read J.R.R. Tolkien, it was like, oh, um, wow, like no landscape and yeah, no cars, <laughs> no shiny things, which is what I was had a real knack for. And, yeah. uh, but realism in general, it was gonna, whatever I was going to do, it was going to be high realism uh, in gouache, which is still my medium all these years mm -hmm. later. And uh, but uh, yeah, and so now I had a, two tracks, um, which was Tolkien in private, just for myself, um, as a, as a, just an exploration of like there weren't very many illustrators doing any of this. This was sort of the late '60s, early '70s. Mm -hmm. Um, it was um, still relatively new and a kind of a cult thing for many people. Sure. The paperback books had become popular in the U.S., but uh, a decade earlier, not many people had heard of it. It was an expensive book to buy in hardback, you know, and uh, yeah. which is something that one of the lecturers um, spoke about in the past conference as well. It was very interesting sure. to talk about how without Tolkien there wouldn't be modern fantasy. I mean, he just had this extraordinary ability to combine American pulp uh, sci-fi, horror, um, you know, sort of fantasy genre yeah. with this kind of highbrow British tradition of uh, fairy stories and, and sagas, mythology and sure. so on. And, and the, uh, the explosive kind of com combination of this sort of high and low uh, form of yeah. novel writing ensured that, um, you know, this, this whole thing was born, this, this new genre, and now we've got Star Trek, Star Wars, sure. and all the rest of the... Uh, kind of, uh, well, you look at the 60s iterations. and 70s and the real battle back then, people didn't even really recognize Tolkien in North America. It was all about horror movie swamp yeah, things, yeah. and then the battle for space between, you know, United States yeah. and Russia yeah. and everything. Science, science, Every, sci -fi, science yeah. fiction. It was aliens, it was spaceships, and everybody got caught up in that, and then out right. came Star Trek, right. and you've got all these other, you know, incredible, you know, shows and yeah. books. The imagination. You know. Everybody loved to grab those little paperback books that had, yeah. you know, some yeah. story about some yeah. alien abduction. It was affordable, it was, you know, you know like accessible. For sure. Yeah. And so this was a whole new road being paved by Tolkien. Absolutely. Yeah. And so your inspiration comes from him. When did you when did you first get your introduction to him to, you know, submit art to him or to draw for him? How did that happen? Uh, as I say, I just started um, drawing stuff, painting stuff, getting it from mostly the Lord of the Rings, which I read first, and then I read The Hobbit, uh, following that, um, and it was just like things were coming to me quite spontaneously and mm -hmm. I wanted to capture it and um, a couple of little illustrations that were done in, a, in an academic book that I remember and uh, the you know picture of the wizard Gandalf and what, what was I guess Gollum or uh, yeah. and, and a Bilbo and, and so you know styling my art around that a bit styling it around Tolkien's own art which mm -hmm. was giving me ideas as well and I wanted to be very authentic to him that was quickly an important part of it for me um, as a you know new professional artist uh, kind of coming up um, in the business I was in at the time it struck me that uh, 
we, because calendars were starting to come out in the 70s, okay, yeah. and they were different illustrators, not necessarily professionals, uh, and Tolkien's own art was kind of amateur and in general style, um, deliberately done, done that way. Um, and all around, um, I thought, someone needs to do give a professional touch to um, his world. And so I'm looking at... Um, so you're thinking you need to tweak Tolkien's world. Yeah, like, pretty cool. like that someone's got to yeah. bring some, some <laughs> order to this. I think I need to, to tweak Tolkien's world. Well, just yeah. that I, I wanted to bring yeah. some authenticity and professionalism and realism to Middle Earth, which is so vivid to most of us readers, you know, and... and it was just like no one else is doing this. I guess maybe I'll assign myself the job of um, glorifying his his beautiful Lord of the Rings, and and see what happens. And and I'm getting ideas from American luminist artists, uh, landscape painters. Uh, Albert Bierstadt was an early mm -hmm. um, influence on me. Mm -hmm. Like I said, Parrish uh, and others. Uh, um, Frederick Church, particularly, because he does these massive epic. If you ever go to a museum and see these kind of these, um, they take up a wall. 20, 20th century um, American yeah. masters in, in night, late 19th century. It is like it, it takes up a wall. It's incredible. And mm -hmm. So you're thinking that's the scope that Tolkien deserves in many ways. And, and mm -hmm. so it went, I went for the landscape primarily, and then on into um, you know, honing my skills, uh, drawing the characters. Uh, monsters and other things, um, which was wasn't second nature, so I had to re work a lot harder at that. Um, and yeah, but uh, I, I started getting people interested, and first the family was really really yeah. supportive. Um, you know, keep going, and it was kind of a saving grace for me as a teenager as well, when I'm kind of working my way through. Yeah. You know, um, religious pressures coming at me from one direction and other oh, wow. kinds of you know cultural kind of like and the drug thing and all of that. You sure. Know, like, yeah, and so uh, my, like the friends I met in high school were it's a bit of a mixed blessing because I was really like, try some marijuana. You're like, well, try acid. You know, you'd love it. It's like, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what happens. And I well, got sure through all that. Dragons, yeah, it? yeah. <laughs> you know, it's all of a piece in some ways. And uh, actually, the, the cars tie into it as well because it's very psychedelic with uh, the colors and the shininess and all the rest of it. And, I'm sure that's how know, some cars are designed. The glamour, the yeah, glamour. See, that's sure. a, that's a Scot that's a Celtic word that means a Gaelic word meaning um, enchantment. Yeah. And so it's now, of course, associated with fashion and, and modernism. But uh, sure. it's actually an old word that means very magic. That's smart. So. Glamour is my, that's cool. what I, I do glamour. <laughs> nice. So you're going through these times in your life, so you're obviously going to have some, some tough times and some good times. Is there some times during any of that where you felt maybe you had kind of derailed from your art, or do you think it helped you kind of harness it? Well, you know, I, I, the Tolkien art for me was a refuge um, mm -hmm. from um, difficulties in our family. My mother had a second uh, marriage, and... Uh, um, it was very hard for her. He was, you know, not the most uh, sterling person. Um, he did his best, but uh, he just, you know, he, he took on four children and then had one of his own as well. And uh, it mm -hmm. was, it was, uh, you know, it wasn't easy um, at all for my mom. She uh, had to work a couple of jobs and things like this. You know, we were all, um, thank goodness for her uh, stamina and ability to just you know, handle these things. But. Uh, we saw her through those years, and then she eventually divorced um, him as well as my father uh, in the mid-60s. So that kind of stuff uh, was um, a lot of instability for me. Mm -hmm. And um, as a sensitive kid, you know, thank goodness I had a, a refuge in art, and that was one reason I think I uh, threw myself into it as much as I did. Sure. But there was also an emerging musical side as well. Um, and I, w I was struggling with, you know, what, what I f my feelings around religion, around Christianity, we yeah. were raised in the church as kids, then we kind of abandoned it when uh, we moved to uh, Don Mills from a small town in Woodstock, which was in between Godrich. Um, also great memories there, and uh, and it just kind of muddled through those years and sort of, you know, how I felt about my sort of moral standing and, you know, whether these things I believed or not. For, and I, I usually thought things through very carefully. It was yeah. kind of intellectually, you know, curious and so on. So. That's part of my background as well. I just um, I had a mentor who uh, would very much push the idea of like read up on things, decide who you believe, you know, that you sure. accept and, and that resonates for you and feels true, and just and so you can kind of navigate these things and make up your own mind about yeah. what you think about you know the background of the church and, and uh, philosophical ideas. I mean, I've, I've become a bit of a Carl Jung, um, um, okay. you know. 
I, I schooled myself in a lot of that. You know, I'm, I'm interested in human nature. I mean, I, uh, I think as an artist, it's part of that too. You know, you just kind of like sure. You absorb these things and you put them out in, in the form of your art somehow. Well, it helps you to develop some of your characters too. Yeah, I'm sure. yeah. If you can exactly. think about them on either a moral or lack thereof, yeah, yeah. right? You know, it's going to help you kind of design what that person may resemble. Right. And the, there are uh, scholars of Tolkien who have um, noticed the relationship between his mythological underpinnings and Jungian ideas of, um, you know, the, the, that he brings to uh, the idea of the universal sort of unconscious and mm -hmm. um, various and sundry um, mythological concepts that um, do um, seem to be manifested in something like Tolkien's art. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff that has to do with fantasy, like wizards and stuff too, that a lot of religious people won't even let some kid buy. A, yeah, there was they, they won't let you buy a, a Harry Potter book. Yeah, that's they, right. Because there's wizards in I'd it. And forgotten, there's a whole, but that's true. And a whole yeah. dark side I used to, to get that. a bit of that sort of, you know, oh, you know, it's about the sorcery and magic, you know, that's all very pagan, you know, it's like, mm mm, bad, you know, you shouldn't expose yourself to that. And, and rock and roll, which I absolutely <laughs> adored and all kinds of popular music, like, yeah. oh, you know, I had to kind of throw out some albums because they might be, you know, a bad Goodbye influence Sabbath. on me. So, so what's your <laughs> <laughs> Black Sabbath. And I had to rebuy all those albums, realizing that no, it wasn't actually bad for you at all. It was Goodbye actually Black somewhere. Sabbath, Hello Carpenter. <laughs> <laughs> just like oh so but I've developed very eclectic music taste in all I'm of sure. that you know there's always yeah. an upside to these things but yeah <laughs> it was it was a bit of a, a roller coaster at times in that way and uh, and, and you persevered and pioneered yeah, through that as well yeah, too yeah, yeah would you say that now so here you are you've got Tolkien you're working in tandem with you're doing work with right your first illustrations where do they wind up and what were your first illustrations right um, I had, by the time I started looking to have my art published in some way or other, and I'm realizing that, you know, if these guys are getting their art put in calendars like that, and they're looking for people who are inspired by Tolkien but weren't necessarily assigned um, formally by the publisher, um, this would be one way to get into it. And so I set my sights on that, um, hmm. and it was a bit of a roundabout uh, situation. I first wrote to Ballantyne in New York, who were publishing the paperback editions of Tolkien's books, and they were putting out a calendar from there um, at that time. Then they kind of said, well, thanks, but we're not interested right now, you know, maybe come mm. back in a while or something. We've got people assigned for our next few years. Uh, I ended up going to George Allen and Unwin via the Tolkien Society, um, and this Tolkien Society is based in Britain, and they yeah. were not that many years into their, you know, being organized and formally sort of accredited, whatever, um, and, and I didn't even know they existed because no internet, nothing, you know, I, yeah. I, see, I see a blurb in a book of, of art by um, of an amateur uh, called the Middle Earth Portfolio, and I'm inspired by the art itself too, I was like, yeah. oh, I could do those scenes, I could do them much, much more kind of like uh, professionally and so on, like yeah. there's that professional thing coming, and um, I um, ended up joining the society in the 80s, and uh, that led me, my art, to being sent over to, by photos to one of the editors at Allen and Unwin, mm -hmm. who contacted me in Canada, in Toronto, and uh, suggested the following year that I meet up with one of their editors at the World Fantasy Convention, I guess it was, in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. So I signed up for the convention, arranged to meet this fellow, and he looked at my originals, and he said, I'll get back to you. And then within a few months from that, they said, well, we picked four of them. We're going to put them in the 1987 calendar, along with Alan Lee, and along with John Howe, and along with wow. Alan Roger Garland. So that was when um, three of us first were published together. Mm -hmm. And we've got, all of us gone, gone on, um, including Roger Garland, al although he passed away some years ago now, and uh, was you know, generally considered a lesser light because it was very stylized, his art. But me, Lee, and Howe seem to kind of have a bit of a thing between us, it's like John Howe with his ink um, style artwork, sure. um, and Alan Lee with a more of a watercolor look to it, um, and yeah. then my uh, kind of high realism thing with the epic landscape style and approach and sure. so on. And then, uh, well, that makes it like a concert, right? Like yeah, it makes yeah. everybody's kind of got yeah. their own thing, it but it at the end of the time, yeah. it makes one heck of a. It establishes kind of a well. Here's your province. Here's mine. And and, and I always sort of had, was was clear about wanting to be authentic to Tolkien. Yeah. And I would get people um, writing to me, saying, you know, how did you know it was in my head? You know, it seems exactly what I was imagining. And I yeah. repeatedly get this kind of comment. So that tells you, okay, I'm on the right track. You're I'm in kind sync. Of like 
yeah. connecting well with uh, this author, and I have mm -hmm. a real sympathy for it. And, and it clearly is a meaningful part of my artistic legacy. Uh, yeah. And I just continue to um, expand from that, you know, and I was getting this kind of uh, wonderful feedback. Because I knew sure. as soon as I got out there, my stuff got out there in the world, so it, would, it would be, um, you know, yeah, it would, it would create a bit of a, st a stir. And, and I was kind of half expected some real professional to come along and take over, you know, oh yeah, like I've just kind of dabbled here. Yeah. It's a kind of amateur thing, you know, it's just my, my own private you know, indulgence. Uh, and, and so <laughs> far, no one has come along that I feel like, Oh yeah, you know they're they're way ahead of me on this stuff. You know they've really nailed it down. Yeah. So I guess I was supposed to meant supposed to do this, and uh, cool. I did actually contact J.R.R. Tolkien himself before he passed away in 1973, and I was just in the first year and a half or so of doing mm -hmm. pictures. I sent him a few photos. This would be 72, and I got a letter back from him, which was tremendously encouraging awesome. for me. And yeah, 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 and I just. You know, and it turns out that he was you know, getting more and more fan mail in those days and, and crazy phone calls in the middle of the night from North America, people who don't have a clue, like mm -hmm. it's like middle of the night, 5 a.m. Six now, hour difference in Britain. Whatever, yeah. uh, but he would be very gracious in, in general about these things and was conscientious about writing back to wow. uh, people like me, which was really, really nice. And Before things all turned into social media and yeah. having to share things oh, and yeah. who knows what's the and truth. got a, a the letter in the mail, right. that was a big deal. That's yeah, cool. You know, yeah. So what's it like for you the first moment you see some of your stuff published? Pretty exciting. Yeah, for sure. Know, right? I, we, we lived in um, Willowdale in near Fairview Mall, and um, I would go into the classic bookshop there, which probably doesn't exist anymore, and always look for the new calendar in August. And, mm -hmm. You know, the Valentine or the one from Britain, whatever was available. And to see my own calendar finally coming out was was pretty <laughs> big deal. It's like I bet. yes, yes. Yeah. I'm you know, and then following year another one contained four pictures of mine. Uh, and then uh, a full calendar of my art in 1990. Yeah. And then from then on, it was every two, three years I would get another one. So, and, uh, so what was it like for you <clears throat> then, not only seeing that, but you start to see movies over the last 15 years and you're watching The Hobbit come out and right. you know all the other rest of the series. What was it like for you? Did you ever feel that you needed to be involved in that or were you involved in any of that in any capacity? Well, there's a bit of a story there. Mm -hmm. um, so around the time, this is 1999, I guess, um, there were all kinds of stories about how they were going to make a full uh, film and yeah. Peter Jackson would direct and this was going to be a, a special effects extravaganza, the whole deal. Yeah. Um, and they were looking for artists um, because up until then it was all illustrators doing uh, various versions of, of, the, of, the, of Tolkien's world. and. Uh, there was a certain amount of established look mm -hmm. because of people like me and Howe and Lee and others. So um, they actually invited me to work on the movie. Um, I got a call from a producer at the time and um, we had a conversation and uh, you know, asked him a number of questions as well about like, because in my mind what I wanted was to work from my studio here yeah. and that would have been Markham at the time. And. Uh, you know, so just what, farm the workout to, to them, but uh, they wanted me to, of course, join the whole crew there with the movie kind of technical crew, everybody you know, kind of in one big creative group. And, and you didn't that. go? I didn't go. So you, so you didn't go. So <laughs> I'm going to stay here in my humble studio there, <laughs> while you all go to New Zealand. There, and were, there were extenuating this. circumstances at the time. <laughs> Unfortunately, I had just left my marriage um, oh. and it was it was amicable. We yeah. were on, had an understanding and we were going to look after the kids, both of us, and mm -hmm. kind of co-parent them. And I got an apartment and everything was organized for that. Um, I was also in a relationship, a new relationship around that time. So it was just like um, leaving for Wellington, New Zealand, as much as yeah. it would be amazing time for me. For sure. Um, I kind of thought about it very carefully after discussion with uh, the Richard Taylor, who called me one of the producers and you know, it was a wonderful guy. And, uh, and I just ended up saying, um, I'm, I'm gonna sit this one out, but. But you got to consult. You got yes. to consult and you got to help come up with some of the ideas and some of the characters design. And well, they definitely used my art. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, with or without permission. Um, but, you know, I was able to arrive at the theater when it first um, was was released yeah. and had, you know, the, the fans joy of watching what is, you know, what they brought to the screen um, roll out in front of me. 
um, without any kind of inside kind of you know participation particularly um, and that was nice for me you know and I have not had any problems since then with uh, a recognition or continuing my yeah. work and being published and all the rest of that so it was, and I ended Amazing. up going into a, an exhibition the following f um, well that would be 2001 an exhibition in London at, in um, um, Camden Town where you had been yourself yeah. uh, and was a fantastic experience Re great coverage by the local um, um, the, the left bank what do they call that anyway there's a TV show that's yeah. well known there and, yeah. uh, and um, um, yeah, so that's uh, amazing. No problem. And Harper Collins, who are the publishers of my uh, art, uh, yeah. uh, Tolkien's publishers now, after George Allen and Unwin, uh, they assigned me a three calendar series, um, original art for the mo uh, for the books, Lord of the Rings, yeah. to kind of come out concurrently with the film releases, which was 2002, three, and four. Um, so there was was also the official uh, film calendar as well, but um, sure, yeah. But you know, cool. so I, I did okay. <laughs> so this is also mind blowing for me because there's so much that's going on in your life. Sort of a modern day version of The Hobbit, in sort of a way, would be Game of Thrones. Right. Maybe okay. So we've got Game of Thrones. It's been this massive hit. And you actually were involved in that in some capacity, too. You were asked to do some illustrations. Yes, I was. George R. R. Martin came to me uh, about 2006, it would have been, um, asking if I would be interested in illustrating um, a Game of Thrones, or actually one of the books, which there were about four of them by that time, and that uh, they were bringing out special editions, mm -hmm. um, collectible editions, signed and numbered, um, uh, sort of an elite deluxe editions, essentially, uh, illustrated. So, um, of course, I was curious about it, but I hadn't read any of George R. R. Martin. And I went to my friend Martin Springett, an uh, illustrator friend, and I said, who's George R. R. Martin exactly? He goes, oh my God, <laughs> if he's come to you, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so I answered <laughs> George's uh, email uh, in the affirmative. I would love to do that, and, um, but I'm sorry to say I'm unfamiliar with your work. Mm -hmm. At which point he sent me through the first three novels and signed them, and, uh, and I went on to become a big fan of the books. Uh, I thought they were addictive, yeah. and I enjoyed them very much. And then some years later, we actually got around to this uh, illustrating of the game, game of Thrones, which is a bit of a story, but um, uh, as well as a um, number of castle illustrations, which was another project and separate and sure. entirely. World of Ice and Fire, this kind of coffee table book, well illustrated. I remember Ice and Fire. So mm -hmm. um, I worked on about 14 castle paintings for that as well. And it's amazing because I've watched how you illustrate castles versus how people expect castles to look. And we right. talked about this off camera earlier about how people think of castles, but they think more Downton Abbey and they think, you know, more Shrek, you know, mm -hmm. those kind of mm -hmm. castles, right? Yeah more English v. <laughs> and your castles are hanging off of cliffs with you know little tiny boats and it's not like your typical castle with a gate and a moat where does that inspiration come from where did those ideas come from um, yes it was um, a case of um, doing research on castles and how they are conceived around the world what are the common features and um, and having discovered that there aren't actually any real castles in uh, Lord of the Rings or any of the other Tolkien books mm -hmm. um, so um, this is a more medieval type world of George R. R. Martin's and so therefore he himself helped me conceive of the particular uh, fantasy castles that he uh, uh, yeah. came up with uh, for his books um, so even that it's not typical stuff and uh, so we had to kind of just like work out okay what um, what what do we want to do with these and thank goodness he was uh, there to guide me unlike J.R. Tolkien <laughs> <laughs> so interesting so you've had this incredible life what's next for you Ted what's next for me is um, a series of commissions on a Tolkien theme there are a couple of other book illustration cover illustrations um, on the schedule as well um, and it's all fantasy, so mm -hmm. um, I'm just well involved in, in that work. Um, my longtime friend, Alex Lewis, is now my agent for commissions, so he will get calls from and emails from uh, folks interested in something original from me. And for the last uh, two and a half, three years, that has been uh, my main work, actually. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I continue with that and um, with, uh, you know, just generally fantasy, I say, you know. Thank you for taking the time to meet with me today. Thank you, Kevin. Thanks, Appreciate Kevin. it very much.